Okay, I'm going to show you how to build an economic model from scratch. And this is really something that will help you understand and read economic models better if you can start just building goofy models on your own of, you know, weird little decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis. You'll kind of get the hang of it. And after you built a model, you can you'll need to check it for economic mistakes because there are some logical mistakes that you just have to iron out. But in this video, I'm really showing you how do you set up a model from step zero. Now, before you even start building an economic model, you do need to understand the parts. So I'm going to let this be step zero. And when I say the parts, I basically just mean what is a choice variable, what is an exogenous variable, what is an endogenous variable, what is a benefit, what is a cost, what is an objective function? Those are basically the parts. And I'm not going to go over that here, but I will put a link below to uh, a video or two that will help you orient toward the parts. That's step zero. Once you've got those down, then you can actually build your model. So the first real step in building an economic model is to figure out what is the choice variable. And of course, to do that, you're going to have to figure out whose decision are you modeling and what do they actually have control over. And for this video, I'm going to model the number of guests to invite to your wedding. And of course, you want to name that with a variable, so I'll let G be guests. Now, it's really important that you understand whose uh, decision you're modeling to make sure do they actually have control over that. And so this perspective of this model is from the perspective of the bride and groom collaborating to decide about their wedding. Now, the second step here is going to be to brainstorm costs and benefits. And this is the fun part, of course. So I've brainstormed, why would you want to invite more guests to your wedding? And it's going to be, well, the wedding's more fun with more guests. Um, inviting people sort of validates the relationship, the friendship, it sort of shows them you value them and you want them there for your wedding. Um, it's, uh, you get to show off to more people how beautiful you look in your wedding dress or whatever um, and some people might say the wedding is more meaningful if there's more people because of course you're sharing your values um, with with the people in your life saying I really value love and kindness and you know saying your vows is a meaningful thing and having more people in the audience to sort of hold you accountable and um, help you live out those values that's of course really important and, and I think it's also sort of um, solidifying a support system of people that you might want to call on to help you in your marriage throughout. So you could actually go on and on with the list of benefits to inviting more guests. Now, what are the costs of inviting more guests? Um, obviously money, but also like hassle, you have to arrange for more things. Um, uh, stress, having a bigger wedding means there's more people sort of paying attention to how good the wedding is. Maybe the more people you invite, the more judged you'll feel about the quality of the wedding. Some people might feel that. So brainstorming the benefits and the costs. Now you're not going to include all of these in your model. You're going to include the ones that you would like to focus on. So that means that um, you're just narrowing the list of things that will be in your benefit and cost. It doesn't mean that you don't think these other things matter, it just means you have chosen to focus on two or three or maybe four or five things rather than an infinite number of possible motivations for inviting more guests. So when I think about um, weddings, um, I honestly think the validating of the relationship is probably one of the bigger benefits. So that's the one I'm going to choose. And of course the financial cost of having a wedding is pretty pretty stressful as well. And since maybe I'll do a model with three things, so I'm going to let hassle be the other thing I'm going to choose. So once you've brainstormed the costs and benefits, I guess the next step would be to choose a couple that you like and name those variables. So I'm going to call this V, validation of relationship. I'm gonna call this M for money and we'll call this H for hassle. So the third step here is going to be to select your favorite costs and benefits and to give them a name or a variable that you can use in your model. 
Now I'm going to erase all of this and just use the variables that I've already defined. The next step is to take the variables that you've already defined and to place them into a model. So you know that models are going to involve maximizing something or sometimes minimizing something, but when you're first starting, just have it be maximizing something. What is the thing that you're choosing when you maximize? Will you choose your choice variable? So that goes underneath the maximization sign, noting that you're not maximizing your choice variable. That's not ever what you do. Um, you maximize your objective function, but you define your choice variable, which I will do now. And then of course you need to place your benefits and costs as a function of your choice variable. And if you're familiar with the types of variables and the setup of models, then you'll kind of know the benefits are a function of the choice variable, the costs are a function of the choice variable, and you want to make sure the sign in front of the benefit or cost is associated with whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. So is validating relationships good? Yes, it's got a positive sign in front of it. Is spending more money bad? Yes, it's got a negative relationship in front of it. So we're just placing the variables we've come up with into the classic structure of the model. That's the next step. Now, this is a model. So you have fully built a model at this point. But a lot of times we want to build these models for the purpose of doing little thought experiments. And to do those thought experiments, you oftentimes want to insert some interesting exogenous variables. So um, the next step really is to brainstorm exogenous variables. So exogenous variables are going to influence the optimal choice of number of guests that you would want to invite. But if you change the number of guests that you have at the wedding, the exogenous variables should not respond to that. Now that's just the definition of an exogenous variable. So you're just thinking about what factors are going to influence optimal choice. And let me just brainstorm a few right here. So the things I came up with are the size of the bride and groom's extended families, the number of acquaintances they have, the overlap of the bride and groom's so social circles, uh, the bride and groom's sensitivity to stress, um, how extroverted they are, which might relate to their sensitivity to stress for this specific circumstance, the income of the bride and the groom. And I'm going to pick three different exogenous variables just to be fun. Two would be a more normal one for students first building their model. But I think the income of bride and groom is a good one. I think uh, sensitivity to stress is a good one. And the size of extended families. And of course, once you've picked a few that you like, you need to name those and make sure the names don't overlap with any of the uh, you know, letters you've already used. So size of extended families, I'm going to call that F f for families, sensitivity to stress, I'm going to call that S, and income of bride and groom, I'll call that I. So step five includes not just uh, brainstorming and choosing a few, but also placing them into the model. Now, to place these into the model, you're going to have to figure out which cost or benefit does each of these belong inside. So size of extended family, well that's going to matter a lot for how much you're validating the relationships with that family. So, so basically, F belongs inside this function. You're basically going to place each exogenous variable inside the most relevant cost or benefit. So I've just stuck this new exogenous variable inside here. And so what this means is um, there's a relationship between validating relationships and family size, meaning if I hold the number of guests constant, but I increase the size of my family, that's going to have an effect on the validation of people in my life. So obviously increasing the size of the family means, oh, there's keeping the, the guest list size the same, there's a lot of people who are going to be upset and not going to feel validated. So I just placed that in there. Now, sensitivity to stress obviously is going to belong in the hassle part of the cost. So let me put that in. So, and, and that one's fairly obvious. If you increase the, your sensitivity to stress, that's going to increase the hassle you experience 
even while you hold the number of guests the same. And finally, um, income of bride and groom. Now, if I'm going, I mean, obviously this is sort of where that term belongs. Now, I will say if this is literally defined as money, then that doesn't quite work. You're going to need this to be something more like the pain of spending on people. Um, so I might need to redefine money like as financial hardship or something like that. And if I redefine this as financial hardship, then I can just stick income inside there. Okay, so that's just a basic overview of how you build an economic model. And I will say the cost benefit brainstorm table is one of the key features of that. In economics, you just get really used to putting together those tables if you want to build these models from scratch.